Hello and welcome to the Corporate Facilities Council Benefit of the Month webinar, Building Design Responses to Mitigate COVID-19 Virus Threat. I do want to let everyone know that they have been muted for audio quality, and if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box, and we'll go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. And also, I do want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and you can find a copy of the recording on the CFC's website, ifmacfc.org. At this time, I'm happy to turn it over to Wayne, who is the CFC Secretary and Programs Chair. Wayne, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joshua, and thanks as usual to you and the HQ team for uh, setting this up and helping us with our webinars. We really appreciate it. So everyone, we have a really good program for you today. Um, I, I just want to mention that the uh, IFMAS Corporate Facilities Council is the place uh, for O&M, for our FM uh, universe out there, and uh, we're great place for resources for you to connect with uh, like-minded individuals who are managing the same type of facilities that you are uh, and a great community of folks that are always willing to help. So uh, if you've never checked out the Corporate Facilities Council uh, or joining, uh, take a look uh, at our website and our magazine to get a flavor for what it is we do. And uh, today is a perfect example of that where we're bringing you some very uh, cutting, bleeding edge uh, information on really where we see the uh, COVID threat kind of coalescing now, uh, which is in airflow and HVAC. And I've uh, been getting a lot of requests to uh, talk about this topic. So uh, the individuals we have for you today, uh, Rick and Michael, are experts. I, I can vouch for that. And uh, they're chock full of information. So we will have plenty of time at the end for questions. We can go over time uh, if necessary. So uh, please type your questions in the chat box, and we will try to get to those at the end. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Rick and Michael. Great. Thank you very much, Wayne. Um, again, my name is Rick Russell. I'm a principal over at Interface Engineering. And Mike? And I'm Mike Fleming. I'm an associate principal and the leading of the uh, commissioning team out of our San Francisco office. Yeah, so we're pleased to be giving you this presentation. This is a question we get asked about very often, and we've been working with clients uh, to go through what they should be doing with their facilities. So we'll give you a flavor here of what, what we've been seeing out in the field right now. Um, maybe a little bit about ourselves quickly here. Mike, next slide. Um, so our firm, uh, we're an MEP firm. We've been around for 51 years. We have offices in uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Portland, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. The uh, type of services we offer are MEP engineering, fire life safety, technology design, lighting design, um, energy modeling, simulation, and then Mike. And then we also cover uh, commissioning, making sure that the end product for new buildings are what they should be. Uh, we focus also on retro commissioning and post occupancy analysis, troubleshooting of any issues that buildings may have. Great. And our work is uh, international, so we're not just regional. We we work all over the world. So, next slide. Okay, so let's get to the presentation here. So. Um, what are the ways that the viruses are contacted? So, you know, I, I, I do have to say we are not doctors. Uh, you know, we just hear this through uh, through the research that we've been doing. So we're mechanical engineers, not doctors. But So how how is the virus being spread? Um, it's being spread by either direct contact, uh, indirect contact, as you can see folks touching rails, uh, close contact when you have a room full of people, and then airflow induced contact. Uh, next slide, please. So how, how do we mitigate this? Um, so you, in summary, what we're gonna be touching on here is how to remove the virus, how to neutralize the virus, how to dilute it, uh, how to divert it, and how does one defend from the virus? And then how do we track to make sure that uh, this is continuing to work? So a, a little bit about the virus. <clears throat> Again, not a doctor, but I just this is an important slide because we're going to be talking about filtration later. So I think it's really important for you guys to be able to see this. So what you've been hearing in the news is, you know, oh, you have to have social distancing, um, and there's really two two things that we're worried about here. One is the virus inside of a droplet, right? And so the droplet is is a sneeze or a cough or spit or something um, where it carries a bunch of this virus. So the size of that is about one to three microns. Um, the virus itself is 0 0.006 microns. Um, and so when we're talking about it getting aerosolized and the virus is just sitting there out by itself, um, it is 0 0.006 microns. Next slide, please. And so this is what we're talking about here. When, when they talk about maintaining social distancing, 
um, you know, the droplets are heavier because it's, it's got um, moisture, water, spit, and, and so it'll drop down. But once it gets out of the droplet and it becomes airborne, it can travel a lot further. So you could see here one meter, right? So that's approximately three feet. Um, but once it gets aerosolized, um, it could actually go uh, roughly 30 plus feet. Um, so that's that's the big deal about making sure that you don't have it uh, get aerosolized. Actually, there was one one study um, before we get to this study here, Mike, um, that talked about masks and what to wear. And um, they were saying that like the N95 masks are great, the cotton masks are great, uh, and then the gaiters that you'd wear. So a lot of folks that you know go skiing or go fishing, uh, the gaiters actually aerosolize it. And so it's worse to wear a gaiter than to wear nothing at all um, as far as uh, propagating the, the, um, the virus. But speaking of case studies, Mike? So this is another case study that was completed um, earlier this year. And this was actually a report of contact tracing in a restaurant in China earlier on during the pandemic. So in this situation, they were able to identify one initial case which was someone who had traveled from the Wuhan area to this restaurant. And then after that, there was an additional nine cases that came from this specific restaurant that this person had been in. What they were able to do was analyze where they were sitting and the HVAC system of the actual restaurant to determine how the air um, would have been circulating in the space at the time um, as a way of helping to identify the spread. What they were able to identify was that the cluster of people that were sitting together were all served by the same wall-mounted fan coil unit. So the air in this specific area was circulating but was not spreading to the rest of the restaurant where there was not any new additional cases that came out of that area. So earlier on we had um, sort of keys to mitigate and we sort of focus on three of them here. The remove and with this wall-mounted fan coil unit, we were not removing any of the airborne pathogens. The filtration levels that were in a typical wall-mounted fan coil unit are much too low to be able to catch something like coronavirus. Additionally, we talk about diluting the air and making sure that we are adding additional fresh outside air so that we're not just recirculating. And once again, with these wall-mounted fan coil units, they typically rely on opening windows or opening doors to be able to provide fresh air and not provide any fresh air themselves through that unit. And then finally, we are talk about diverting air, making sure that the air that's already in the space isn't just being recirculated back 100%. But once again, we have with these wall-mounted fan coil units, they especially push the air right into the breathing zone. So even if any of the aerosolized virus was up top, now it's pushing it back down to where people are. So this is an example of how some existing um, HVAC systems might not be ideal for um, helping to mitigate the spread of coronavirus. And it's, it's really interesting, actually, Mike, if you wouldn't mind going back to that slide. Um, you know, so if you see here the, the yellow A1, that's, that's the ground zero person, if you will, that, that started a whole th the whole thing. And then you could see the dates next to all the other red circles um, as when everybody started, everybody else started uh, exhibiting the coronavirus symptoms and got tested positive for coronavirus. So um, it's just, it's kind of interesting how that quickly spread. Uh, next slide. So let's, let's talk about remove, right? So if they were able to remove the virus, they would have uh, been a lot better off. So how, how do you do that? So, you do that with uh, active ventilation, right? So if we can get the animation to move here to see the filters, um, you know, we all pretty much familiar with the MERV rating. So that's how you rate a filtration and its effectiveness. Um, MERV 13, well, before we move there, uh, most of the older buildings um, weren't required to have higher filtration, right? So you might have some buildings that are MERV 8. And so that's what the systems were sized for. Um, and if you want to upgrade it to uh, install, like say a MERV 13, which is good at taking care of the droplet, uh, the virus when it's in the droplet, uh, <clears throat> that filtration is, is larger, right? And not only is it larger, but uh, it has more pressure drop associated with it. And so the things you'd not want to look at before you um, retrofit an existing air handler is, you know, 
does my air handler have the ability to accept the larger filter? And if it does, or if I can retrofit it easily to do that, do I have enough horsepower in my fan to take care of that? Um, and so, you know, you can either choose to upgrade the motor for your fan to take care of that. Um, some fans, unless you're at the limit of your fan. If you're at the limit of your fan, then you would have to look at, at purchasing a new fan. Um, the other thing you can do too, depending on what type of systems you have or what type of occupants you have, is perhaps you can um, uh, do this at the sacrifice of temperature control, right? So maybe if they were used to being able to control their temperatures to 70 degrees, um, if you were to eat up some of that horsepower and you were able to get them 72 degrees, um, maybe they would be fine with that, right? Knowing that they're being protected from the coronavirus. Um, the, the next step to go is MERV-18, right? So MERV-18, these are, these are HEPA filters. Um, normally you would see HEPA filters, not in an office building, but you would see them in hospitals, not everywhere in a hospital, but you would see it like in orthopedic surgeries. Um, you would see them in laboratories, like in a vivarium, um, where you're holding the, the test subjects. Um, but for the most part, you would not see this in a school, you would not see this in an office, um, you would see it in clean rooms, uh, you would see it in compounding pharmacies. Um, so you would also see it in your car and in your vacuum cleaner. Uh, but it's to, to retrofit your system in order to handle a HEPA filter is very, very uh, invasive. It, it takes a lot more space uh, and, and chews up a lot more horsepower. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Electronic filtration, this is something that can be used as well. Uh, this is not something that we see a lot of our clients um, gravitating towards. Uh, they typically just type, like to go through the mechanical filtration uh, just because this, this adds a, a level of complexity, um, but it, it is an option to go forward with this. So the other way to take care of the virus is to neutralize it. So how do you neutralize it? Well, one way to neutralize it is to use ultraviolet light. Um, and this is something that can be uh, installed in an existing system or can be placed in a new design. So, but what type of ultraviolet light, right? Well, first let's understand where the ultraviolet light is, right? So you have the visible spectrum as be, can be seen. And then to the left of the visible spectrum is the ultraviolet. Now there are three types of ultraviolet uh, rays that we're gonna be talking about here. So there's UVA, UVB, and UVC. So UVC is the uh, type of ultraviolet light that we typically use in order to um, kill virus uh, or neutralize the virus. Um, the only problem with the UVC is that it causes cataracts and it causes cancer. So, you know, the, we have our ozone here layer here. So we have the three types of UV, right? UVA, B, C. So UVC is typically 100% absorbed by the ozone layer. Um, UVB is about 95% absorbed through the atmosphere. Uh, and then UVA is about 5% absorbed, so we get a lot of UVA. So how do we generate the UVC, right? Well, we actually put together um, lights that, that can actually issue that, uh, send out that wavelength. So there are really two ways to do this, right? So how do we disinfect surfaces, right? There's equipment disinfection, area sterilization, and uh, to take care of the microbial growth. So an example of a surface um, neutralization is something like this. Right, where you have UV, uh, UVC lights, um, where you put an object inside of that chamber and you uh, neutralize the virus that way. Uh, again, nobody can be in this space. Um, you can also place it inside of a, a hospital room or any kind of rooms. Uh, they have these units that you can put in and it'll take care of the virus inside that space. Uh, there is a little robot that I've seen an article on that you actually put it in a room and then you walk away and it's like a little Roomba. And so it goes around and it maps out the space. And then once it's mapped out the space, then it'll go ahead and open up the, um, the access to the light. And then the light will go around like a little Roomba and it will, um, it'll clear up the space. So the other way to do this is in the Airstream, right? So we talked about surfaces. Well, how do we do this in the Airstream? Well, what you can do is you can go into the air handling unit. All right, so next slide, please. Um, you can put it in the ductwork or in the air handling unit itself. And so we can talk about a couple of these examples here. Let's look over at the next slide. 
So here's an example of the UV lighting system inside of an air handler. Um, and so as the air goes by, then uh, the UVC will neutralize the, the virus. Um, some things to be concerned about or to worry about is you, you can't just put this UVC light inside your air handler. You have to interlock it with the door uh, and you also have to block out any kind of um, windows that you have into the air handler. Again, just because it can give you cataracts and causes cancer, you don't want to expose um, the facility engineers to this. And so if they're walking into the, you want to be able to, to shut it off. Also, um, you know, there are concerns about the UVC and the effects on the filter paper uh, or the cardboard. Uh, and so that's something that you may want, if you're going to install something like this, um, you may want to talk to your filter provider just to see if they can alleviate any concerns with that or have a product that won't get eaten away um, by the UVC. Um, so here's an example of a UV light that goes into a ductwork. Um, so you can see the blue rods that would be inside the ductwork and then you would have that uh, tan um, component that would be sitting outside of the ductwork. So one thing that should be mentioned about ductwork, uh, next slide please, is that you can't pass the air through the UVC light very quickly or it won't have enough time to neutralize. And so what you wanna do is you wanna size it to 500 feet per minute. So typically ductwork is sized um, between 1500 feet per minute and 2000 feet per minute. So it's going three to four times faster than what you would really want um, for it to uh, neutralize the virus. And so if you decide to put this in the ductwork, let's say that a particular tenant wants to protect and, and you know, your other tenants don't wanna protect. And so you know, you're gonna put this in the ductwork just for that particular tenant. Um, you'll have to make sure that you have enough space in order to enlarge the size of the ductwork for about eight feet. And then you can go ahead and neck back down in order to get back to your standard design velocity. You know, the nice thing about putting it in the air handler is the air handler is already sized at 500 feet per minute. So typically your coils and your filters, um, they wanna run at about that velocity. And so that's why it makes a lot of sense to put it inside the air handler because you don't really have to do anything to it. It's already got the right velocity. Next slide, please. So here's, here's an, some interesting data uh, with respect to neutralizing the virus, right? So here they did a study that combined UV and filtration. Uh, and you can see at the top there, you have uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So those are MERV ratings. Um, and so, if you have, say, a MERV 15 filter uh, and UV lights, you can uh, eliminate close to 70% of the coronavirus. Um, so it's showing there at 68.5, as opposed to like, if you look at strep and staph, uh, you know, you're, you're almost getting rid of all of it. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is going back to the size of the um, coronavirus uh, itself at 0.006 microns. Is, is very small. Next slide, please. So the other way to use UV is, is to not put it in the air handler at all. Um, they have what's called UVGI upper room. Um, and so what, what does upper room mean? Um, upper room means just that, that the unit is placed in the upper portion of the room so that it's not in the line of sight of folks and it's neutralizing the virus up in that space. So the idea, if you can see the image on the left, is you have air that's circulating. Typically when you have an HVAC system, um, they're sized for mixing the room. And so the idea is that you your air would go up into the ceiling and it would neutralize the virus and then that neutralized air would come back down. So there's, there's other, of course, newer technology uh, folks are trying to figure out, well, how is it that we can help neutralize this virus? So um, here's a company that makes fans, uh, BAF. And what, what they do is they've actually put in a UV light at the top of the fan. Um, and so the idea here is as, as the fan is rolling the room, then it's making that room go into the upper portion of the ceiling. And then that unit, um, irradiate or excuse me, neutralizes the, the virus. So one thing about these is I did ask uh, one of our manufacturers representatives what it would cost to, you know, how often do you have to replace something like this? And I believe it was every one to two years, you need to uh, replace the UV um, cartridge or, or component up at the top. 
And my understanding, it was about $200 uh, to change that out. So, you know, maybe, maybe if you're looking at a solution like this and it's one or two rooms, then maybe you do something like this. But, you know, if you have a lot that you're going to be putting a lot of these fans in, you know, perhaps it would be uh, better to um, install it in an air handler. Uh, next slide. I must warn you, there is a squirrel outside my window here. And if my dog sees that, you might hear some dog barkings. This is the joys of sheltering in place. Um, so some of the new UV products. So we, you know, we talked about how do you take care of the surfaces? So, you know, you, you have the UV light that you can put on a, uh, any kind of surface to irradiate it. Actually, we've, we've spoken to clients about, um, well, you know, maybe we put UVC lights up in the ceiling and we take we neutralize the virus in the evening like after everybody's gone home from work um, but you know the clients aren't all that receptive to that because uh, the liability concerns um, you know well, what if the janitor staff comes in you know how do you interlock it um, what if somebody's walking on the street and you look up through the windows that haven't been closed and you can see the uvc light you know now are you liable for uh, anybody that gets con cancer on the street or cataracts um, there is another technology, if you look to the right there, um, is a little gate, right? And so that gate is not UVC, that's um, what they call, I think, far UV technology is what they're coming up with. And so this is where you can have it in places of, of large gatherings. So next slide. By the way, I, I talked to one of our clients about that gate, um, and they weren't necessarily receptive to it just because they want to get a better handle on this far UV technology to make sure that there are no health concerns. But you know, here's an example of the far UV technology being used in some sort of transportation center, whether it's a train station or an airport. Um, and the idea is that it is um, taking care of the virus there and the wavelengths are such that it's not harmful to humans is what, what is being reported. Uh, another method of of uh, neutralizing the virus is to use this photocatalytic oxidation. Uh, and what it does is it goes through and interacts with the virus um, and it, it destroys the cell. And essentially what you're getting is water and CO2 um, on, on the, uh, as a byproduct of it. So this, this pretty much works like a catalytic converter. So you could think of it as a catalytic converter inside of your, your air handler. Um, in, in our experience, this is not something that most of our clients are talking about. Um, I would say that they're more uh, talking about the, the UV lights. Next slide, please. There's also bipolar ionization. Uh, now there are units that, that come with this type of technology as an option for a fan coil. We have a project over at Skilled Nursing Facility right now where um, we are specifying some uh, water source heat pumps and this actually comes as an option. And so what it does is it strips the electrons off the virus and uh, destroys it that way. Um, <clears throat> this is what that unit would look like. Um, so on the top there, you see those tubes that goes inside the airstream. And at the bottom is the actual component itself. And we actually have a slide showing it inside some ductwork. So you can see the tubes there are inside the ductwork. This happens to be, uh, the leftmost happens to be inside of an air handler. Um, the middle picture uh, actually is, is in the ductwork leaving the air handler. Next slide, please. So diluting, this is actually something that you can do, you know, with the systems that you have right now, but I'm gonna talk about the pros and cons of it. Um, it's definitely something that you can do uh, with a new design. So let's just start into it and I can talk about that in a little bit more detail. So, you know, with, with systems um, that have an economizer, right? So, right, what, what's happening here? Uh, let's consider the room uh, to be the right part of the screen. So you're returning air from the room, it goes through the return fan, and it can either get returned back to the coils or it can get uh, exhausted out of the building. Um, and so typically what you would have, just roughly, well, let's just say for the sake of argument that you're bringing in roughly 30% outside air um, and then 70% of the air you're recirculating, uh, and you're bringing in that 30% of outside air just to make sure that people are not passing out from CO2. Um, but what's happening there is you're, re you're recirculating 70% of the air that potentially has coronavirus. Uh, and so you would have to have that level of filtration, you know, the, either the, 
the MERV-13 or, or HEPA, right? So the MERV-13 would work great if you still had it in droplets, but if it was aerosolized and the virus was just in the air, um, you know, you would need a HEPA filter. And we already talked about the energy penalty uh, that you would pay in order to put in those type of filtration units. So one way to avoid this um, return is to bring in more outside air, right? And so your return damper would close and you would be exhausting your air and you would be bringing in 100% outside air. Well, the, the problem with that is most systems are not designed to do that for a design day, right? So let's say um, that it's really hot outside. Let's say it's 100 degrees outside and you know, you're maintaining your space at 70 degrees. Um, you know, normally you would be bringing in 30% of 100% outside air or, or of 100 degree air and then you would be mixing it with seven, 70 degree air. And so your coil is not conditioning 100 degree air, it's conditioning something uh, in between 70 and 30. Same thing with the winter, right? Um, if you had the space at 70 degrees and it was 30 degrees outside, you know, you wouldn't be just conditioning 30 degree air. If you're returning, you would be conditioning um, somewhere between 70 and 30. So you can dilute during the shoulder seasons um, or when the temperatures are moderate. Um, and you can even dilute during um, the larger, or excuse me, during design conditions. However, when you're speaking with your tenants, the tenants need to understand that they're going to lose temperature control. And so, you know, what's, what's their tolerance for something like that? Um, the other thing you can do as well is you can uh, up upgrade your cooling coils to make sure that you do have that capacity, but then you would need to look at other things, right? So you need to look at your chiller capacity to make sure that um, you have that additional capacity. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, you have systems that have dedicated outside air, right? So this would be like a laboratory. I, I did have a client come up to me and say, well, you know, my tenants are coming up to me and they're asking me, well, you know, tell me what kind of filtration we have um, because we want to make sure that we're getting the proper filtration for our space. Well, you know, I, I, I ended up telling the developer, well, you know, your, your units for laboratory uh, are 100% outside air. And, and so it really doesn't matter because it's not like you're returning that air. And, and unless you're having a convention of, of uh, folks that are infected with COVID-19 just sitting outside your outside air intake, um, the filtration is not as large of a concern um, for a unit like this or a space like this, like it is for an office that is doing recirculation or a school. Um, now here though, if you have a dedicated outside air unit, um, a lot of folks are going to be recovering the energy from that, right? So they're going to have an enthalpy wheel or some sort of energy recovery wheel um, that uh, is going to be rotating between the exhaust stream and the supply air stream. And the, what we recommend here is that um, you bypass this uh, during, during a pandemic time like this because you don't necessarily want a wheel that has been exposed to coronavirus to be rotated into the supply air um, because that's just a risk that uh, is, is unnecessary, uh, but there is an energy penalty to be paid with this. Uh, you know, if, if you still wanted to have energy recovery, uh, what we would recommend if you were uh, either doing a new design or wanted to retrofit to uh, an, an existing system is put a runaround coil. Um, so the runaround coil has uh, coils in the exhaust airstream and the supply airstream. And so you know, water is running through that coil. And so you never have direct contact with the air. You're just transferring that energy via water. Um, again, there's an energy penalty to pay there. So you'd want to make sure you do an analysis to see what the additional motor horsepower penalty is compared to um, the energy that you're recovering from those air streams. So this would most likely work better um, in, not in moderate areas, but um, in areas that have a larger temperature difference, extreme temperatures. Next slide, please. So diverting, so how, how do you divert this, this um, to divert the airflow away from you? Um, so they, they had studies that showed that um, multifamily spaces and hotels uh, with the incorrect pressurization are a good way to infect people. Um, and this is actually something that you can do to your existing facility right now. You don't need anything special. You just need to rebalance it. You need to make sure that the corridor is positive and that the rooms, the adjoining rooms are negative so that uh, somebody with coronavirus in one room, the, the coronavirus does not go into the corridor and then go into the adjoining space. 
and so you're you're keeping a pressurization bubble there to uh, contain the pressure the the virus into one space. And like I said, this is something you can do now. You just have an air balancer come in. You don't have to do anything special to your system aside from balance. Next slide, please. So another one uh, is personalized ventilation system. This is not something that that uh, we've designed. Um, you know, it looks like you have like your own private nozzle, like on an airplane. Um, and so I don't know if furniture vendors are incorporating this. I want to say that I either saw this at some sort of green build show or something where, you know, the, the furniture maybe had these nozzles in there. And, uh, you know, there was a, a, a duct bank that went by and it just tapped into that. But this is not something that I have seen. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you are enveloping yourself with a, a a shield, if you will, of, of uh, clean air. Um, probably the, one of the closest systems, though, that we've come to uh, that incorporates this is uh, a UFAD or underfloor air distribution, raised floor, uh, where folks have their swirl diffusers at their at their space. Um, you know, one one thing that you can do though is you could just go to a store and and purchase one of those uh, personal HEPA filter type units. Um, I've seen. Uh, people put those at their desk, right? And so it's accomplishing the same thing, right? You've got this HEPA filtered air that's that's going around you um, and it's scrubbing that air. Next slide, please. So defend, how, how do we defend um, against the virus? So one, one way to defend um, against the virus is to provide signage. Um, we see a lot of this in our clients' uh, facilities. Um, we also see them provide, um, along with that signage, they'll have, let's say, like a film that they put over the elevator buttons. And this film is, is like an antimicrobial film. Uh, and for some reason, it's, this helps um, keep the virus from being spread. Um, it is something that they need to change every once in a while. Um, but more what I've been seeing people do is um, providing uh, these copper, it's like a copper poker, it's, a, it's like a copper hook. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later actually. So here, another way to defend um, is to make sure that the relative humidity is high. And it's not the, and, and when I say high, I mean in a range of 40 to 55 or you know 40 to 60. Um, so, what what they've found is you know when you have lower humidity um, say like 20 to 30 percent like it's showing up at the top um, the mucous membranes start to dry out and so the body's ability to fight off the virus um, is is hindered uh, and so that's why you want to bring the relative humidity up uh, between 40 and 55 so um, depending on where you are in the country uh, this may be something that's already being done it may be something that's not being done um, so on the East Coast, like say our Washington DC office, um, we'll be looking at providing humidification. Um, you know, in California, um, it's not really something that we do unless you have a space, again, like a laboratory, a vivarium or a surgery center or something like that. Um, so in the cases where it's not part of your existing building system, um, what you can do is, again, you can get these portable units um, and you can spread them throughout uh, either whether you want the folks at their desk to have their own personal one like you know when you have your sick child or actually when you're sick yourself like i was uh last year um you know you have this little unit that sits there and you fill it full of water and you know you might need to refill it um every day or two but uh, for the most part it's it's pretty self-sufficient uh with the exception of that um the, the other thing to do uh, if like say your units, your air handling unit when we were talking about the filtration uh, is not really able to handle the, the HEPA filter, you can get a unit similar to this that um, you can start placing throughout like say an open office area or a classroom or conference room or whatever room you deem appropriate. Um, and you know the manufacturers will tell you like how much area will be covered. And so you could just plug these into the wall and spread these throughout. And you know we've seen clients uh, opt for this because it's it's very simple. You just go to your local retail store and purchase this. Um, again, here in California, a lot of people already have them because we've been experiencing a lot of fires. Uh, and so people purchase them in order to scrub the smoke out of the air. Uh, and some of the units actually already come with 
with UVC lights inside. Um, so most most people here already have them, and they get the benefit of actually being able to use the UVC light and and to scrub their their spaces. Um, you know, an interesting thing to note before I leave this slide when we're talking about filtration is um, and, and fires is when you have an area like Colorado or or California where you're having these fires, you know, it's you have this problem because in order to uh, mitigate the virus, you have to dilute the air. Well, what does that mean? That means that you're bringing in a lot more outside air. Um, well, but what do they say in order to mitigate the smoke from coming into your building during fire season? Well, they they say to go ahead and close your outside air damper. And so, you know, these are two forces that are uh, conflicting. And one, one thing that we've had our clients do, and, and we've seen this implemented, is to put in um, charcoal filters, right? And so they get these roll of charcoal filters and they put it on the outside of their um, outside air intakes. And so that way they've been able to still bring in the outside air uh, and they've been able to filter out the, the smoke. Next slide, please. So lots of daylight, uh, you know, they found that daylight uh, boosts the immune system. And so you're bringing in um, the daylight, it, it gives you vitamin D. And so that's a way to, to help um, mitigate the virus. And this is something architecturally, as you're designing new buildings, um, they'll work with, you. you'll work with them to, to come up with skylights and um, light tubes and things of that nature. Next slide, please. Um, this one's big, uh, it's, it's touchless devices, right? So this is whether you have uh, um, soap dispensers that are touchless, faucets that are touchless, hand sanitizers or door openers, um, and then the hand dryers. Um, I've even seen, I've even seen uh, doors that have these little foot doorknobs, if you will, and uh, you just use those in order to open up the door. So you take your foot and you, you put that down low and, and use that to open the door. You know, I, I think that that probably needs to be looked at a little bit more just because you don't know if it's a trip hazard, a kick hazard, how does that work with ADA? Um, but I mean, I think right now people are just trying to react to see what they can do to mitigate the virus any way they can. So here, here's actually probably a good place to talk about this uh, copper hook. So apparently copper, um, the virus can't really live on copper. And um, so they're making these little copper hooks um, and, and the copper hooks also have um, like a pointer on the end of it. And so presumably you can go around a space and, and open doors with this copper hook and you can press elevator bot buttons with this copper hook. And so I know of one developer um, that has purchased a bunch of copper hooks and has distributed it to uh, their staff within their building. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we've gone through what actions to do, the next question is how do you actually track and ensure that making these changes are in fact offering um, the end results that you want? So one of the good ways to sort of monitor um, within the control systems that you may already have is to make sure that you're monitoring your indoor air quality. So this is done in three ways. The first one would be to focus on any controls on your scheduling of your equipment. Um, with systems running 24-7, it would provide an adequate time, adequate circulation to anything that may have been inside the space to be filtered out or neutralized, but the energy cost for that would be much higher. So what we recommend is moving forward and making sure that additional circulation is provided prior to occupancy inside of your building. That way, there's time for the building to get ventilated and it's not stale air that's been in there for a while um, and may have coronavirus or other um, problems within the air at that point. Additionally, within your current control system, typically there's humidity sensors spread throughout the space. So monitoring these, ensuring that these are adequately calibrated um, is an important step to making sure that the longevity of any of the measures that you take um, continues on for as long as the building is operating like this. So ideally, we wanna make sure that these humidity sensors are reading in the 40 to 55 range. Um, as Rick had mentioned earlier, that's the range that um, the body is able to best defend against um, viruses. 
and also able to um, make sure that there's enough humidity that those larger droplets are able to drop to the ground instead of being aerosolized. And then finally, you can track the CO2 in your space. Typically, larger conference rooms um, or larger spaces that are highly occupied will have CO2 sensors already in the spaces. And being able to monitor these to make sure that um, as a replacement for making sure that the spaces are being adequately ventilated. So typically, most control systems will react when CO2 in a space gets to be above 1,000 parts per million. But part of the recommendations now for trying to improve ventilation for the building is lowering those set points so that its systems are able to react a little bit earlier when rooms become highly occupied. So these are just steps that you can take with existing control systems um, as a way to try to track it and a way to try to um, mitigate the system, mitigate the coronavirus as best as possible. Additionally, there is now advanced tracking that can be done through control systems, um, through whether it be dashboards or monitoring-based um, commissioning or analytics devices. Um, these are typically softwares that will sit on top of existing building controls. And what they do is they'll go to another level of monitoring your system and making sure that everything is operating at its best as it can be. With this, one of the common metrics is air changes. What an air change is, is the amount of time it takes or how many times the volume of the room is recirculated through based on the air that's being provided to the room. So these are really typically measured in air changes per hour. So there's two metrics that can be tracked. Um, one is air changes, total air changes per hour, and then the other one is the outside air changes per hour. So being able to track these will help to provide an idea of how your buildings are performing and whether the changes that you made are able to actually mitigate and are continuing to operate correctly. So typically the targets right now, if you have added filtration and UV to your air handling units, is to focus on providing about six to 10 total air changes per hour. If um, UV was not added onto it, and if you know that you're not um, circulate, you're recirculating more air, then the goal is to focus on increasing those outside air changes per hour. Another step that typically helps is to ensure that the building that you are currently operating is operating as efficiently as possible. Um, typically, this is done through a recommissioning process. This can be done in-house um, by any of your facility managers or outside consultants can be brought in as well. But the goal is to ensure that all of the sensors in the building are adequately calibrated, any dampers, any actuators are ap operating the way they are intended, and to ensure that the sequences of operations of the building are operating to the best that they can. And if changes have been made, improvements can be made um, to ensure that your building and your systems are operating as efficiently as possible. So this is typically a step of going through and functionally testing everything, um, making sure that the equipment reacts when it's supposed to, making sure that actuator linkages haven't been removed or aren't stuck or jammed or anything like that. So this way you're assured that the changes that you are making to the system are truly operating as best as they can. And then finally, going one step beyond that, there's also monitoring base commissioning. Um, and this is another option for more long-term savings, more long-term comfort within the zones and within your buildings. Um, this is, once again, as I had mentioned, the system that will sit on top of the controls and monitor to ensure that everything is still operating correctly. This will provide additional advanced alarms so that if equipment looks like it's beginning to fail, you as facility managers are able to know ahead of time that efficiency of your chiller is starting to drop 
and maybe maintenance or preventative maintenance is required on it. Or if your outside air levels are not what they should be, you're able to get those alerts so that you're able to react to it proactively as opposed to reactively after an issue has been discovered. So thank you very much, Mike. Um, so in summary, what are the ways that we can uh, mitigate COVID-19 inside the space, right? So one is to remove with filtration. Uh, the other is to neutralize, whether it's UV lights or ionization uh, or that uh, catalytic process. Um, dilution uh, by bringing in more outside air. Of course, you want to make sure that um, the tenants in the building understand, you know, they might lose temperature control or maybe you do a fine balance of, you know, a, not 100% outside air, but maybe 50% outside air and, um, you know, you lose a little bit of temperature control. Then there's diverting, right, which is to uh, make sure that you're not recirculating the air and that everybody's getting their own uh, personal outside air or filtered air, if you will, and then defend. So making it so folks are not having to um, touch as many surfaces and, and avoiding that as much as possible. So we, we have a, a cheat sheet, if you will. I think you're going to be getting a copy of this presentation. And so um, what this does is it um, would let you know what, what's an ad and uh, what, what do you have existing for your building. Um, so if, if you want to um, increase the HEPA filtration, right, that would be an ad for an office. That would be an ad for, for residential. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, if you want to increase the bandwidth of the air side economizer to bring in uh, more outside air, that, that is not an ad. That is something that you would already have built into your system. And so it's just a matter of uh, negotiating that with your tenants or just to see what kind of uh, loss of temperature control you would have. So this is something that you can look at and see like, okay, if, if we're doing a new building or if we have an existing building, um, you know, does this asset do we have to add this or is this something that we already have and we can just work with what we have now? Um, you know, some, most actually, a lot of our clients with their existing buildings, what they're doing is they are just, they're opening up their economizer screen outside air and they're changing out from their MERV 8 filters to MERV 13 filters is, is a lot of what we're seeing as a very first step here uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Next slide. So I thank you all for, uh, for your patience. Uh, I thank the squirrel for not upsetting my dog and having her cause a scene. Um, so with that, um, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Right. And just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please feel free and type them into the question box and we'll be happy to present them. I do have some questions here waiting for you. Okay. Give me one second. The main question is they're loving the presentation, so they all want copies. I do want to let everyone know that a recording will be posted to the CFC website, which is ifmacfc.org. And are you guys going to make a PDF copy of the PowerPoint available? Sure, we can do that. Okay, so you will also have that posted to the website as well. So that is, I've gotten quite a few questions wanting that one. So that is a yes. Another question here is here. For VRF type of air conditioning system, what okay. would your, be your recommendation for the fresh air intake? Yeah, so for a VRF, um, so if you have, say, a concealed fan coil that's attached to, that is with the VRF system, um, typically what you would have for those is your outside air would either be a dedicated outside air system that you're bringing in the air to the fan, to the fan coil itself, um, or you have some sort of a, a vent, either a roof vent or a, a vent that's going out the side of the building uh, and you're using the fan from the, the VRF fan coil to bring in that air. Um, so in that case, because in either case there's, there's outside air being uh, provided, what we would do, what we'd recommend is try and bring in as much of it outside air as you can, try and increase that outside air amount. Again, you, you're gonna pay a little bit of a penalty, right? Because that's not what your coils were sized for. And so you have to weigh the balance between, you know, are we gonna start losing temperature control uh, versus, you know, providing more outside air to dilute any kind of virus. Um, 
what what I would do is I would look at uh, changing out the filtration to maybe MERV 13. Although unfortunately with these VRF type systems, they've got these little squirrel cage fans, and so they don't have a whole lot of static pressure. Uh, and so what what you might what might happen there is you might pay a penalty as far as uh, reduced airflow. Um, so your your air will be filtered. However, you know again you might you might not meet the temperature requirements of the space. Um, but certainly if you have a MERV-8, you know, I think the better filtration that you could put in there, the, be the better. But uh, MERV-13 MERV um, is, is what takes care of, of the virus inside the droplet. Yeah, and just to add a little bit to that, I think we'd want to, as Rick was saying, increase your ventilation, your outside air as much as possible. So I think working with a test and balance contractor um, and ensuring that you're getting as much fresh air out of those, whatever that unit is that's ducted to it, um, and opening up those balance dampers as much as makes sense that you can get as much air as possible out of it. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is there a concern with ozone and BPI? Ozone. So we... We are not um, seeing a lot of these systems um, installed uh, for the ionization. Um, have I heard that that has not been a concern from our clients? Uh, it's not something that we've really looked into. Um, but then again, we that's not our go-to. We would normally go to a, a UV system. So I guess. I guess I would have to do more research on that, but it's it's not something that we've acknowledged as a as a concern. But again, we're not we're not doing a lot of the the ionization. We're doing more of the UV. Sorry, I think that's going to leave you wanting for more <laughs> of an answer. <laughs> but I can do a follow up on it if you'd like. Okay. Another question is: What are your thoughts on placing air purifiers in conference rooms? in order to scrub the air more frequently than the rest of the floor. One concern coming back into the office is face-to-face -face meetings in the confined room versus the open office area. Yeah, so what, uh, what you could do there, so in our presentation, what one of the things we talked about was providing that uh, portable HEPA filtration unit. Um, so you could go to one of your local stores and purchase them. I mean, you can get them online as well. Uh, and, and what that's doing is the more air changes you can get to that HEPA filter scrubbed air, uh, the better. Um, in fact, I mean, that's how clean rooms work or compounding pharmacies work is they have what Mike was talking about um, at the end of the presentation, there was air changes. So the more HEPA filtered air changes you can get into the space, the, the better, because you're just scrubbing that air. Um, so yes, that would be a, a strategy that we would recommend for um, not only just a confined space, but uh, in, in open office type settings. Thank you. If ionization is added to HVAC, are portable humidifiers needed? Because the ionization will react with the humidifier? Is that, is that the concern? I, they didn't provide any additional. Yeah. I, uh, if ionization is added, will portable humidifiers be added, be necessary? Um, so I guess I'm trying to figure out, is there a concern that once you, you have the ionization in there, um, are you going to be reacting with the humidified air? And so then I guess that becomes a question as to where, where do you provide the ionization? Do you provide it upstream of the humidifier or downstream of the humidifier? Um, Maybe, maybe I can do a little, I, if I think that's the question, I can do a little bit more research on that. Um, okay, we'll see if she um, sends in any additional information. She's still online, so she might type some more stuff into us. What is the oh, recommended airflow? Be... Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see if she has any more for us. Um, the next question is, what is the recommended airflow um, CFM for an enclosed office with a floor area of 10,000 square meters. 
1,000 square meters. So, um, so for COVID-19, um, you'd want to be anywhere like Mike was uh, mentioning between six and 10 air changes. And so that calculation um, for CFM or airflow uh, would be, um, you want the volume of the space. So you have your square footage and then you take the height of the ceiling. And then um, let's go ahead and just pick a number in the middle, let's say eight. So take the volume of your space, which is your area and times your height and then multiply that times eight for your air changes, and then divide that by 60, which is a, a constant. Uh, and, and that's the amount, that'll give you the amount of airflow in cubic feet per meter. So make sure you're using the correct units. So when you're using the volume, when you're calculating the volume, make sure you're using um, square footage and uh, feet for the height. Mm -hmm. Do you have any links or information on the copper hooks? I can send that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you send it, we to can me, add that I'll to the end of our presentation. We can add it to the end of our oh, presentation, okay. and then that way, when we send oh, out the PDF perfect. for the presentation, it'll have that in there. Excellent. Thank you. Typically, the VRF uses typical air filters, and it's not recommended to use even HEPA filter. Do you have any recommendation in addressing this concern? So um, those VRFs, so we've actually used VRFs in hospital um, situations. I've actually used them in laboratories too, um, back in like 2005. I think I was one of the first folks to do that here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, the reason that you can't use uh, that higher level filtration is because of um, what I had said earlier is those those fan coils don't have a lot of horsepower to them. They have what's referred to as a squirrel cage motor. So if you imagine a little squirrel running around, um, you know, they're not very robust type fans. Um, you can you can provide that level of filtration if you want, um, and I have done it, but you can't just rely on the fan coil for the horsepower to push the air through it. So what you would need to do is you would need to have the fan coil and then the fan coil is there to uh, provide the cooling. And then downstream of that VRF unit, you would have to have what we would call a booster fan. And that booster fan has enough horsepower uh, in order to get the air through that higher level of filtration. And so if you're going to modify your existing system, um, you're going to want to make sure that you're sizing a booster fan uh, and providing power to that, of course, uh, in order to get through the, the HEPA filter or the, the MERV-13 type filter. There, there are some VRF units. Um, so there are some VRF units where you can have like a, a regular static, but you can, you can also ask them for a high static unit. Um, now, high static is relative, right? You'll, you'll be able to get a little bit more pressure out of them, um, and you might need to change your filters out a little more often, um, but they should have a little bit more horsepower to, to get you through that, that filter. But if you really want to do it right, you would add a booster fan. Okay, this next question actually I know this person, they're out in your neck of the woods, so you'll really understand this one. So as we had to reduce our outside intake due to smoke, can you yeah. talk a bit more about the charcoal filters and how effective they are and what percent of outside air we might get with these installed? Yeah, so the charcoal filters, um, so we had a, a client who it was a hospital and they were running 100% outside air and um, they they got these mats of charcoal filtration, and they put these over their their units, uh, the outside air intake, and um, that that was able to to mitigate that. Um, we are we are having more and more clients during new design right now say that they want to have the system designed such that you can mitigate that that. Um, the smoke. Now, you know, if, if I were doing a new system, I, you know, you, you would use the charcoal for for the smell, but 
you know, if you go to our slide, um, I believe it was um, MRF 13 and Mike, you, yeah, thank you. If we run all the way up to the top there. There is a filter that um, you can start taking care of the smoke. And so I would actually recommend before you go with the chakra filter, there we go. So let's see, it says there, um, there should be something here that says most smoke. HEPA, all combustion smoke. Okay. Oh no, but then even down at uh, MRF 13. Most smoke. MRF 13 through 16, most smoke. Um, so, you know, if you want to get rid of all smoke, then you want to have a HEPA filter. If you want to do a better job of getting rid of some of the smoke, um, put in a MRF 13 and that, that should, should help it. Actually, I, I did that in our place up here is I just uh, changed out to a MERV 13 in my house system and just had it recirculate within the house. Um, and that did help uh, clean things up. So, and with respect to what effect it has on outside air changes, um, you know, I, that's going to be a function of uh, horsepower. So if you're adding any additional type of filtration, whether it's a MERV 13 to filter out that smoke or whether you've got the charcoal filter on the outside, um, it's, it's going to be more of a pressure drop uh, in order to pull that air through there. And so when you have that additional horsepower, um, the fan runs uh, on a different part of the fan curve. And so you get less and less air. So it really depends on, on your system and what the pressure drop is across the filtration that you're putting in there. Um, so you'd want to look at that on a, a case by case basis. You, you would have to run a calculation and check it against your fan curve on your air handler. So that's what I would recommend. If, if you're putting in any type of filtration, you would want whoever's looking at it to get a copy of the fan curve for your fan and then say, okay, here's, here's the added pressure drop associated with any type of filter. And then they would plot that on the fan curve. And then you'll see what the new CFM is for the fan itself. Um, and then uh, if you've proportionally balanced, so if, if it was 30% uh, outside air uh, and, um, and you reduced the air, the air by that much, then you would just multiply that new airflow by, by the 30%. Thank you. What are the estimated costs for the various mitigation measures presented, i.e. unit modification for MERV 13 and UVGI? Yeah, um, so, so it depends. Um, I would say if we're talking about, so it depends on the size of the unit. It, it, it all depends. Um, so filtration modification, you know, let, let's say that your racks are already sized to handle uh, your filters, um, the, the, the upgraded filters, um, which, you know, going from an eight to a 13, likely it's not. Um, but, you know, if, if you're going to be upsizing the filtration and doing racks, I mean, that's, I would, if it's even possible, you know, that, that could be, uh, let's say on a unit that's doing um, a 10,000 CFM, uh, you know, that, that could be like a, a five to $10,000 hit um, to, to make that modification. Um, the, the UV, um, I would say that's probably like, say on that same size unit, actually, yeah, on that same size unit, um, you, you could be looking at, say, $20,000. Um, but, you know, what, what we could do is um, we could go to our local vendors and what the, the going price is for those and uh, incorporate that as part of this presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If the UV lighting can cause cancer and cataracts, how is the quote, quote, above room and quote, lighting and lights over the fans you showed safe? Right, yeah, and so that's why it's upper room. Um, it's, it's upper room because it's not in the occupied zone. Uh, and so you're not getting a direct, uh, you're not in direct 
contact with the UVC light itself. So um, that's a very good question. So if you were to have somebody on a ladder go up there and now suddenly in they're in the area that's considered uh, upper room, then you would be exposed to that, right? And so you would have to have training in order to make sure that people are not entering that upper room area. And it's also, again, with some of the clients that I'm speaking to, one of the reasons why they, they don't want to go with UVC, because there's just so much liability, right? So what, what if you do have somebody go up a ladder and, and you know they weren't advised on how it could be done or, or what needed to be done or what the uh, standard operating procedures were? What if you had an outside vendor come in, right? And it's your, your facility engineers might be trained on how to do it, but maybe the outside vendor for some reason didn't, didn't get the memo. Um, and now suddenly they're suing you. So, but the whole idea is that it's it's in that upper room and it's it's not uh, pointing down at at the people. But but you do have some exposure if you were to climb up a ladder. Thank you. Next question is, how do you know if you're AHU compatible with a MERV 13 filter instead of a MERV 8? Yeah, that's a great question. So that, that's an easy one. So what you would do is you would go to um, your maintenance, uh, wherever you get your filters from. So you would talk to your facility engineers or you would talk to the service contractor that's doing the service and just say, hey, I'd like to put in a MERV 13 filter. Um, and they'll, they can come in and tell you, if, if you want to do it on your own, um, what you could do is you could look at the air handler and or even your stockpile of MERV-8 filters and measure the width of it, um, or excuse me, the, the depth, right? So as you can see in this picture that Mike has up right now, the, um, the depth of the MERV-8 is not as deep as the MERV-13. And so what you would do is you would go up to your air handler and um, you, know, you, you could contact a manufacturer for a MERV-13 cut sheet and you would see what the depth was on that. And then you'd go up to your air handler and you would see the rack the rack that the um, MERV 8 filter slides in and out of and check that dimension and see if it uh, is in line with the MERV 13 filter. Now, I will say this. I will say that I have seen MERV 13 filters that could fit into a MERV 8 rack, but they're not, um, they, they work a little bit on electrostatic forces. Um, and so, you know, it'll be something that after a while, you'll have to change them a little bit more often. Um, but, you know, at this point, maybe you don't care, right? I mean, anything is better than nothing. Um, but the short answer is what you would do is you would you would go to your air handler, measure the rack, the filter slides in and out of, and then I would go to a filter, your source for your filters, and, and see if they can give you a MERV-13 that would fit in that rack. Okay, now I'm going to piggyback a uh, question off that. Is, what is the typical lifespan of a MERV-13 filter? He's currently doing a 24 month interval. What is your thought? Yeah, again, so that depends on your environment. Um, it depends on, you know, what, what's located on your outside, uh, outside environment. So are you next to a freeway? Are you next to a dusty site? Um, what's going on inside of your facility? Uh, is it just, um, is it a clean room? Uh, is it a bunch of linty kids that are running around? Um, and always putting lint in the air. Um, so it really depends. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, if you have a, a pre-filter uh, on your filter, um, so when I say pre-filter, so you would have a MERV-8, like uh, before, before you go into your coils, uh, and then you have a MERV-13 uh, afterwards, you know, it could last you probably, you probably want to change them out between six months and 12 months. Thank you. It can be very difficult to hold the humidity in an unsealed room that are part of larger building. Are those individual humidifiers really going to be able to achieve 40 to 55 percent humidity levels? Uh, the small, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so you do have to seal a room. We're actually designing a, a rare books clip collection space and currently and that's what we're having to do is, is seal that room. And so um, the idea behind that, though, is it's it's better than than nothing. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it in your house, your house isn't that well sealed, uh, and you put a humidifier in there, and um, you know it it'll do 
it'll do its job there for a while. So all that means though, is that um, instead of instead of it being on for a little bit and then achieving humidity and then shutting down, uh, if you have a leaky building, if you will, uh, then your humidifier will just be on more often in order to make up that humidity. That's all that means. Thank you. Um, since the MERV-13 filters only can catch the virus in droplets, and the droplets tend to drop over time, will the droplets get back to the AC, excuse me, HVAC units where the filters are located, or will they mostly be in the air bound at the HVAC, which will not be caught by the MERV-13 filters? Right. Um, so that's that's correct so if it's not if it's not in a droplet and the the virus is aerosolized um the merv 13 is not going to do a great job of catching it so it's it's going to be the hepa filter and so there's there's a case where um you know let's let's actually look at the example of the merv 15 right so there was that study that said um that if you have a merv 15 filter and the uv light that it was effective at removing 68% of the, um, the SARS virus or the coronavirus. So you're not getting it all. Um, and you can see right there that it's only 68.5% that it's getting. So it's, you know, I, I think at that point, it's just, are you, you're doing the best you can because uh, MERV 13 is better than MERV 8 uh, and you're at least getting 68% of it. Uh, or you could upgrade to a HEPA. Um, I would say upgrading to a HEPA is, is really cost prohibitive and you're really moving to uh, a lot of energy usage uh, and you're really you're moving to clean room type of filtration or, or laboratory type of filtration, hospital type of filtration. And, and when I say hospital, like your patient rooms and things like that, those aren't HEPA filtered. I mean, those, those just have MERV 14 filtration. Um, you know, I'm talking about your operating rooms where you're doing orthopedic surgery. Um, but to answer your question, no, the, the MERV, unless you're getting to a HEPA, um, you know, the MERV 13, or in this case, 15, is, is not getting rid of, of all of it. It's only getting rid of 68.5% of it, according to this study. Yeah, I think we have down to two questions. It says, um, we have a mixture of labs and offices. The office area is served by WSHPs. Where does yeah. the UV system, where should the UV system be installed? At each WSHP? So um, they do, again, this skilled nursing facility that we're designing right now, uh, you can get the water source heat pump with a, um, with an option to put the UV light into it. Uh, and so perhaps in your water source heat pumps right now, uh, you can contact the manufacturer and ask them uh, if they have a, a retrofit for that. Um, but yes, you, you would put it at the water source heat pump. Or, you know, if, if for some reason um, the space doesn't lend itself to putting it there, uh, you can put it in the ductwork like we were showing earlier. It, the thing you just need to be concerned about is making sure that the ductwork is um, made large enough to slow the air down so that the UV um, is effective. Actually, the skilled nursing facility was not UV. The skilled nursing facility is the uh, ionization. Sorry, I was wrong about that. But, but yes, if you put it, you can ask the manufacturer if there's a, a, a retrofit for it. Um, you know, I would like to see it put into the, the water source heat pump. Um, because the velocities are already sized uh, at the correct speed for UV to be effective. Uh, but if for some reason it, it can't go in there, you can still put it in the ductwork. You just need to make sure that, you know, again, ductwork is sized at approximately 15, um, 1,500 feet per minute to 2,000 feet per minute. And to be effective, you should be running about 500 feet per minute. So you need to expand the ductwork for about eight feet, and then you would need to reduce it back down to the normal size. Okay, our final question here before we start wrapping it up is, a, are there any potential negative ripple effects of increased humidity on the facility, such as mold, odor, et cetera? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So what what I can think of right off right off the top of my head is um, your fenestration, right? So if you have any glazing windows, things like that, that are single paned, or say you have double pane that has failed, um, you could get condensation uh, occurring on those surfaces. Um, but you know, the way to mitigate that is to not not make the humidity so high that you're like at 70% relative humidity or 80% relative humidity. Um, what you can do is you can um, keep it below 60% relative humidity because once you're below 60% relative humidity, that's where you you can't you can't grow mold. Um, in fact, if you look at operating rooms, uh, that's that's the standard of care for an operating room is making sure that your relative humidity is below 60% RH. Um, in order to mitigate any kind of mold growth. So, so long as you're controlling it so that you're below that amount, um, you, you should be fine. Wonderful. Um, okay, we're about to wrap up. Did either of you have any final closing words? Um, yes, so uh, this, right now the pandemic is, uh, everybody's learning something new every day. And so I would say that what we're talking about right now is just what we've seen currently uh, with amongst our peers, uh, amongst our local jurisdictions and what they're doing. Um, and so this is just an ever evolving uh, field. So I would say to just continue to learn as we're gonna continue to learn. But as far as we know, these are the best practices to date um, and they can be changing. So don't, don't uh, rest on your laurels. Just always be learning about this because there's no in new information coming out every day. But for now, I would say that this is probably the best standard of care that we've been using. This is what clients have been following. Uh, and we do thank you very much for inviting us to present um, so that we can get this information out to everybody. And we hope it's something that you can use um, to better your facility to help mitigate this virus spread. Great, I wanna thank you both for joining us. You did a great presentation. I've got a lot of messages typed to me about how informative this presentation was. So thank you very much for your time. I want to thank everyone for attending today and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you so much. Take care.